Sometimes there's a hell of a lot more to screenwriting than just writing. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, Senior Editor for Creative Screenwriting Magazine, and today we're pleased to have co-writers Simon Kenberg and Zach Penn, who practically bring us behind closed doors by shedding light into all of the external factors that they as screenwriters were challenged with on this $200 million production of X-Men The Last Stand, aka X-Men 3. But first... Following up on that website we told you about last episode, that happens to be doing a feature film released as a serialized podcast, which is pretty darn inventive, it turns out that so many of our listeners went to www.onthecuttingroomfloor.com to check out the trailer that they have now uploaded the first 10 minutes of the movie on the cutting room floor onto their website as an exclusive for CS Podcast listeners to watch for free. This project is the brainchild of first-time writer-director Jazz Garwal, who is literally podcasting his feature with new episodes out every week over the course of a three-month period at just $2 a month for $6 total to watch the whole film. It's a cool concept, since it gives you the ability to preview the film and then decide if you want to continue into month two or into month three. Also of interest to screenwriting enthusiasts like ourselves is the fact that On the Cutting Room Floor is a film with a plot about a screenwriter whose final script has been sold after his death, and then the dark comedy really kicks in once we see what the studio does with his script. Early reviews from FilmThreat.com cast On the Cutting Room Floor as, quote, an inspired piece of Hollywood satire, end quote. So, if you're into this podcasting thing and want to see what, to my knowledge, is a podcasting first and support an indie filmmaker in the process, make sure to click on over to www.onthecuttingroomfloor.com and you'll see at the bottom left of that webpage a button which reads CS Podcast Subscribers. Click here. So just click that button to watch the first 10 minutes of the film. And while you're on that page, you'll notice that there is a coupon code which will get you 50% off your first month. This is another exclusive for CS Podcast listeners. Um, And of course, 50% off your first month means a whopping $1 for your first month, making the entire film, if you watch it all the way through, a whopping $5. So thanks to those cats for giving us a coupon code for posting the first 10 minutes for free. Check out onthecuttingroomfloor.com and decide for yourself whether or not you want to continue watching the film on your computer in iTunes or in your video iPod. Check it out. Also, don't forget to stay tuned after this Q&A to find out how you could ask a question in our upcoming podcast of The Devil Wears Prada. But now, let's cut right into the Zanuck Theater on the 20th Century Fox lot where we conducted our Q&A in front of a packed house for X-Men 3 with co-writers Simon Kinberg and Zach Penn. As is our uh, tradition, we're giving you guys your own copies of Creative Screenwriting Magazine, if you haven't gotten them already. Awesome. X-Men right there on the cover. It's almost as if Tom Hanks is looking right down at it saying... Wow, one for each of us? Yes, really? one for each of us. Wow, that's amazing. Fancy. So we're going we're gonna to start in the beginning, as we always do, um, just kind of with you guys' history, then we're going to get into the film and uh, get questions from the crowd. But Kenberg, I mean, what is it with you and houses, man? <laughs> you always destroy up? them. That's you true. You always destroy them. And Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you destroyed it. What, like, does Unhappy your wife like, yell at you Unhappy or something? Unhappy childhood. I wanted to destroy my house as a child. That's my All right. opportunity. That's fair enough. Mm-hmm. That's fair enough. Um, let's let's talk about you first. You you were a film school grad. Yes. You were at Columbia, correct? Yes, that's right. And during film school, you wrote a, a pitch. You had you had an idea that became Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Mm-hmm. How did you end up getting that to Akiva Goldsman and kind of walking out of film school with a movie that was basically ready to roll? Um, well, the movie wasn't ready to roll when I left film school. Uh, I in my um, first year of film school wrote a script that. Uh, one of my professors, who was a producer named Ira Deutschman, who founded Fine Line and produced a lot of good um, independent movies, read and liked and um, optioned and then sent out here to Hollywood into the ether. Um, and I came out here on the strength of that script and met producers and agents and things like that and really sort of got into the business very quickly. Um, I was very lucky to land an agent and to get some gigs. And as you know, like, you know, when you start working in the studio system and you're young and new, like, you get really crappy assignments. And that's mostly what I got. 
went back to film school, was going back and forth between here and there, and I had to write a thesis project to get my MFA. And my idea for my thesis was Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and I had met Akiva already just on a general meeting with a produ as a producer. Um, and he was one of the first people I took the idea to, and he liked it. Um, and we went and pitched it to every studio, and every studio passed. And we pitched it again, every studio passed, and then I went and wrote it. Um, and then four years later, it came out in the movie theaters. I'm sorry, your 20 seconds are up. So, yeah. No, I'm joking. Dude, that was fast. I know. Right? Well, I just spent an like, hour talking the about that a year. story there. Yeah, yeah no, no that was to... good. We, we spent an hour talking about that a year ago. But he was, yeah. was he a mentor from you, for you exactly? Yeah, he was actually. Um, he was a mentor for me in, in the sense of he helped get me into the business in a more real way. Um, he championed the pitch. Like I said, we pitched it to every studio and they all passed. And there's a lot of producers that when everyone says no, we'll stop asking. Um, and Akiva, as a writer and as someone who was passionate about the story, um, really sort of bolstered me and made me keep pitching because when all those grown-ups tell you you're wrong, you assume you're wrong. Um, so he said, let's keep pitching and pitching, and finally we found a place that bought it for less than Writer's Guild minimum at the time. Um, and over the span of making the movie, I was there for the four-and-a-half-year odyssey of the film. You know, we had a different... Nicole Kidman was going to play Mrs. Smith. John Woo was going to direct the movie. Uh, Brad left the movie. Will Smith was going to play. We we're going to have to rename the movie. Um, you know, there's, there was a lot of yeah, Mr. And Mrs. Pitt. Um, but it, but at the end of the day, what happened was that because of your idea, you you're a homebreaker basically. You're a yes, homebreaker. Yes, that's the thing I'm most proud of is that if not for me, maybe little baby Shiloh would not be here today. That's right. And and Brad and Jen, they'd still be happy. And yes, I destroyed homes and homes. You should be ashamed of yourself. I am. I am. The uh, karma will come back to me. Don't worry. <laughs> Zach, going back to 1993, I, I don't know how much you could say about this, so you, you tell me, but wasn't The Last Action Hero an original screenplay of yours? Yes. So dare I, so dare I ask, along the hellish process of the studio system and having the governator in your film and everything else that went down, how did you only end up with story by credit? Because it's always kind of bugged me that you didn't get a screenplay credit because it was an original screenplay. Yeah, it doesn't bug me as much. Um, uh, That's good. That's good. I, I, I was fired the day they bought the script. Uh, my writing partner and I were twenty. Um, we were twenty-two when we wrote it, and twenty-three when we sold it. And uh, they—it's a long story that's not that interesting. But they basically fired us the first day and hired the person that we were parodying to rewrite us. So. <laughs> Um, it, it was a parody of a Shane Black script. who's a very good writer, and they hired Shane Black to rewrite it. So, um, you know, how we lost screenplay credit is a more complicated thing that has to do with the arbitration process in Hollywood. And I am one of the only... I've worked on 20-some-odd movies, and I've never seen an original screenwriter lose screenplay credit. However, given how badly they screwed up the movie, I mean... <laughs> I can't tell you, the experience of watching the premiere of Last Action Hero uh, was probably the nadir of my career, and it came right off the bat, so it was kind of all good from then on. Um. You're, you're no stranger to X-Men. Obviously, you have a story by credit on X-Men 2. Talk about working with Brian Singer and what it was like after the success of X-Men kind of caught Fox a bit surprised. They weren't sure how the franchise was going to do. What was it like for you when you came on to X2? To my knowledge, there, there's, a, there's a practice that we're going to talk about a little in which studios sometimes take screenwriters and they, they throw them in the arena like Spartacus or Gladiator. Yeah. And they pay them their full fees to write complete screenplays against each other, competing drafts, and then mix and match a Frankenstein version after that. What was your experience on X2 and working with Singer? And then we'll get to this, this arena. Um, well, first of all, on X2, what had happened was uh, I had a deal at Fox and had worked on some movies for them. And uh, after X-Men, I, I had gone into pitch to rewrite X-Men 1 during production, actually, at one point. Um, and it's funny because one of the things I pitched was keeping Senator Kelly alive because I said, if you ever do sequels, he'd be a really helpful character, which is, I, I would have been helpful in this movie. Um, <laughs> uh, no, just because he would have fit in well. Uh, so I was aware of it. And when X-Men 2 came up, they were in a contract dispute with Brian and with David Hayter, who had ended up getting sole credit on the first movie. Right. So they called me up and said, we can't make a deal with these guys. Do you have an idea for X2? And I said, yes, I want to do God Loves, Man Kills, which is this um, uh, graphic novel. And they It's, said, a, it's a classic X-Men graphic right. novel. And, and uh, the next thing I knew, I had been hired, and I was about to start. And then the next thing I knew, 
oh, Brian actually made his deal, and David's coming back on too, so you're just going to, one of you is going to write X-Men 2, and one's going to write X-Men 3, which, you know, feeling like I was the interloper, I kind of, I thought graciously said, you know what, uh, okay, I'll write X-Men 3, I don't care, I mean, it's not a big deal to me, and uh, I even offered at one point with David, I sat down with him and said, look, maybe we should try to work this out, I don't really want to be in competition with you, uh, and he, he didn't want to do that. And he said, no, we're going to do the Dark Phoenix Saga in X-Men 2. And that's what me and Brian have planned. So it got kind of, you know, it got a little contentious. But Brian, uh, what happened was when Brian read my outline, he read David's outline, he kind of saw the validity in both the different approaches. And I ended up, I mean, I had a great working experience with him. And me and David kind of came to an agreement as well. Um, and uh, then my wife got pregnant with our first baby. So as soon as I finished my second draft, I think um, I've had a I've had a baby with each X Men movie. My wife's like, no more X Men movies, no more, no more. Um, my my most recent son is named Logan, so you know that it's gone through. Um, but anyway, uh, so Brian and I worked together for about ten months, and he's an extremely smart guy, um, much closer in temperament probably to me or Simon or any writer than Brett Ratner is. They're really, you could not find two more different people. Um, a very opinionated and very sure about what he wants. And, you know, uh, as a writer, both, you know, I have to tell you, I was very worried about X-Men 2 after I finished writing on it. I read later drafts and thought, I'm not sure this is going to work. You know, I really, I'm not sure that he's going to be able to do it on the budget that he's got and everything else. And was very pleasantly surprised. But I did actually write drafts of X-Men 2, just to clarify. I mean, it's one of these weird things about Hollywood that you get arbitrated and you suddenly end up with story credit, which d doesn't really mean anything, but that's the way it goes. Obviously, Mike Doherty and Dan Harris also got screenplay credit. Yes. Um, X2 was a huge success. Uh, was there anything before we move on that you want to cite that was an interesting idea of yours in X2 that we've, we've all come to know and enjoy? Well, I mean, I don't want to... I mean, the whole, uh, a lot. I mean, the well, whole, no, sure. I'll I mean, give you an example. Just an example. I mean, Here's the whole the Wolverine mild. having claws. Right. No, no. <laughs> For example, right on. the whole idea that Stryker was, uh, wanted to push a mutant registration act, invaded the mansion, kidnapped a bunch of the X-Men, uh, the breakout of, the whole breakout of Magneto and everything with Mystique and Magneto was in my first draft. Um, Nightcrawler was my, they wanted to do Beast. I wanted to do Nightcrawler. So a lot of that stuff was exactly the same. I did have Sentinels, so that got cut. Um, but it, I have to tell you, I, I think Simon will back me up on this, that I don't, on movies that I don't get credit on, I don't walk around saying, oh, I should have gotten credit on that movie. No, of course. Back you up on that. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I, I was a little surprised on X2 that I ended up with the credit I did, but, you know... It, that's the way it goes. Arbitration is a crazy process. Yes, it, it is. is. What well, just just before we move on to totally geek out, why was there no Nightcrawler in this movie? Because he 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 was so richly developed in the second movie. Yeah. Um. Very simply because the makeup was hell for Alan Cumming, and he did not. He was not excited about coming back. And given that, uh, it's true. And and here's the thing: you have to remember we have this enormous cast of people that we have to deal with, and their schedules are really really difficult. Like. Anna Paquin's schedule, we were just discussing this today, the DVD commentary, she was shooting another movie, so we didn't even have her for the third act of this movie. So that's James Marsden, obviously, was also shooting another movie. Right, it was Superman. So, so we had all these different uh, contingencies, and with Alan, given that A, he didn't really want to do it, and B, we didn't have a great... I love the character, I fought for him, but we didn't want to just give him a throwaway cameo, particularly because the makeup is so expensive and the budget on it is so expensive that... It ended up just sure. falling by the way. I think also to some extent, we talked about it. There's a lot of characters we talked about that ended up in the movie. Nightcrawler, one of them. Gambit, which would have been a new character. Um, I think the feeling was also, from a narrative standpoint, that one, X2 had sort of completed the arc of Nightcrawler and inside the span of that movie. And also, Nightcrawler's relationship to the main plot of this movie, the main plot, let's say, being the cure plot. I think the emotional plot is the Dark Phoenix story, but the political plot is obviously the cure. And Nightcrawler's relationship to that plot would be very similar in, in many ways to Beast's relationship um, or even Storm's relationship. And it started to feel like there were sort of political redundancies inside the movie. And Rogue's. And Rogue's and Rogue, yeah. No, absolutely. So, so Rogue wasn't there, just to clarify, because you guys only had her for about two weeks. Because Anna wasn't there. Okay, yeah. okay. I mean, we would have... That's too bad, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it's a bummer, it's a bummer, because she was so important in the other two It's movies. part of the reality yeah, of making movies. She doesn't yes. have any action in the other... It's funny, because we deal with this all the time. Like Everyone's like, why does Rogue have no action in this movie? I'm like, in the last movie, which I know, because I worked on it, she stole Pyro's power and flew a plane. 
That's it, you know. So she steals. Cyclops, she's more the emotional Cyclops. beat. She's yeah, more the emotional. Exactly. Beat. I mean, it's yeah. the emotional heart of them. And I think that's true in the first movie and the second movie. I think she is the emotional center of the first movie. Yeah. And the second movie, I think she's a little more tangential. Simon, you're no stranger to Marvel properties. Obviously, on Fantastic Four, you worked as an uncredited rewriter. Mm -hmm. You did not end up with with credit through a WGA arbitration. Mike France and Mark Frost did. Mm -hmm. um, there was a ton of writers on that draft, just setting the stage of how you got involved with X3. Mm -hmm. How long were you on Fantastic Four as um, a rewriter, and what was that experience like? It was an interesting experience. Uh, Fantastic Four was, you were talking earlier about studios hiring multiple screenwriters to write separate drafts, like Zach Experience in X2, and then um, sort of taking those drafts and creating a Frankenstein cut and paste from those separate drafts. Fantastic Four had been in existence in development for, I think, 15 years. I mean, literally, the first draft um, goes back to like the late 80s, which is what Mike France wrote. He wrote a draft in, um, in like 1988, I think. When, when Chris Columbus was going to direct it. I think even before Chris Columbus oh, really? directed it, yeah. Um, but Chris read that draft, and then Chris, I think Chris then took Mike's draft um, and rewrote it himself. Um, and then there were 10 years and 15 different writers um, of development on the movie, one of which was Zach Penn. Uh, two weeks. I did two weeks on <laughs> two, that. Right on, just like Rogue, you know. <laughs> Just like Rogue. Um, no, but, uh, you know, and then, and, and another of which was, um, Mike and Dan, Mike, uh, Darty and Dan Harris, who'd done X2. Um, when I came onto the film, uh, Mark Frost, uh, who was one of the two credited writers with, with Mike Friend, Mark had been working on the script for, I think, almost a year or so. And really, this, in, in, in truth, I think Mark Frost deserves sole credit on the movie. I, much more than I deserve shared credit on the movie, I think Mark deserves sole, because I do think that the structure of the movie, um, a lot of the characterizations and a fair amount of the dialogue were Mark's. Um, so I came onto the movie. What the studio had done is they had taken Mark's skeleton of a draft. Um, they had cut and pasted scenes they liked from the 15 years of development of the script. So it was really like a Frankenstein where you had a leg that did not match the other leg. You know, and like one scene that was really broad comedy, another scene that was fairly dark and like Batman brooding drama. Um, and it just read like a mess. I mean, it read like you know, uh, one person had taken 15 voices and slapped them together in no particular order. Uh, and I came on to the movie about a month and a half before they started shooting. And they had a release date and a start date and what they called a scriptment, um, which was half treatment, half script. Half man, half amazing. And, and there's nothing worse than that, coming on to something that's ready to go and they're depending on you for, you know, pages to come out of your head for whatever criteria that they're that they're asking for you as on a day to day basis. How long were you on the film? Just briefly um, before well, I, I, move I, you know, I I would say I was on the film for the duration of the film. Okay. Um, I I, so I, I wrote six month shoot or whatever. Yeah, for about four and a half months. I, I was really um, most actively writing for the first month and a half, getting it close um, so that we could actually just build the sets and sh know what we were shooting, and then I stuck around and worked fairly intensively for the first I'd say three four weeks of photography, and then I was here in L A. Um, at just sort of trouble shooting and, and spot checking over the span of shooting because I was here when we were shooting Mr. and Mrs. Smith and I was sort of living on that movie. Um, so I would get calls every now and then from Tim Story or from Avi and, and Kevin, who are the guys who work at Marvel, saying, hey, we need to tweak this scene or we're gonna, you know, we did a, a fair amount of uh, two, three weeks of reshooting on that movie and that was involved writing whole new scenes. Um, so it was even after production, I was still rewriting. But it's not the worst job. It's the most pressure, but it's actually in some ways the best job for a couple of reasons. One, um, because you know what your writing is going to get made, which is a nice feeling. So you're not in development hell. You know, it's like there's a velocity to it that's pretty great. Um, and also, I don't know how to put it any other way. The expectations are so low. Like, <laughs> you know, like you're writing so fast, nobody's expecting that, you know, you're going to write Chinatown. It's, it's like write a scene that functions in the story of this movie. <laughs> so that's why you didn't get credit. Well, no, I'm yeah, messing maybe. with you. I'm messing with you, man. Come on. No, well, Mark. Actually, it's an interesting credit thing. And, and as we, as as Zach and I, I think, start talking about our our process in this movie, there is some similarity in that. When I was done with the movie, um, Mark Frost and I contacted each other, and we said, "Hey, you know, the studio had the studio determines who they. You probably know this. The studio determines who they think deserves credit, and then the writers all determine among them. So each of the writers determines they think whether or not they deserve it. And Mark and I and Mike France had all been awarded credit by the studio." And Mark and I contacted each other and said, we really feel like we should share credit on the movie. And we wrote a joint arbitration statement, um, which the Writers Guild said they'd never seen before. Two writers that were not writing partners and had never met over the span of working on the movie. We wrote a joint statement. So um, I was very happy that Mark got credit on the movie. And, and um, I was happy that Mark worked on Fantastic Four, too, because I really feel like you know he authored it. 
for the record, John Cohn and Scott Frank joined together uh, for Minority Report. Was, oh, really? was the only other time that I've ever heard come of. On, no, 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 no. Man, I just wanted to clarify. I just wanted to, it's still come pretty on, cool. It's the one thing. I but have. what we've been leading to, <laughs> what we've been leading to, is this story, which is equally as cool. In which, again, to kind of pay you back for the hard work you did on Fantastic Four, Marvel dialed you up for X three as they did Zach. And I think what you guys did is is very rare, much rarer than yeah. a joint arbitration statement. You guys were both hired to write different drafts yet again so that the studio could chop them up. And talk about how that ended up in you guys joining together smartly, I think, to become co-writers. Zach, start with you. Um, well, having been through it before and you know, having been around longer than Simon, as soon as they brought this up to me, I said... This, there's no way I'm going to do this. I mean, this is crazy, and that's it's inappropriate to the other writer. And um, you know, when when it actually came to fruition, I think I was the one who called Simon and said, "Look, let's not let this bullshit go down. Let's get together, see if we have the same opinions about what this should be, and we'll work on it together." Particularly because they had no time. I mean, they kept saying to us, "There's no time. We need two drafts." I was like, if "There's no time. You need one draft right now." <laughs> um, um, but uh, also, um, is anyone from Fox here? Is there anyone from Fox here? Um, well, you... one, quick, one quick note that I forgot to say about the situation was that Doherty Harris and Brian Singer left the opportunity of doing X3 and completing the trilogy to go do Superman. Yes. And they brought with them James Marsden, who plays um, Cyclops in the film, to be right. one of the actors in the new Superman movie. So you guys were entering the most hostile of situations. Yes. And, and I like was, the way you answered together on that one. No, no. And, 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 and furthermore, I mean, it's a strategy. There's, there is a strategy to release, and Fox decided that X-Men 3 – Come hell or high water was going to hit theaters before Superman did, and they snagged the Memorial well, Weekend date. Right. The, Continue from there. I'm sorry. Here's the thing, because there'll be plenty of stuff that we'll say that's negative about Fox. But, but to be fair, to be fair, uh, what Fox understood is that the only way to get this massive cast back together and make it makeable, frankly, because it's an incredibly expensive movie is for it to have a good release date and for it to come at a certain time. And it wasn't like they could push it to the next summer. All those people have incredibly busy schedules. So it was the case that it had to be done at that time. Absolutely. The, the point is that the, the system of let's get two writers and kind of pit them against each other, which would normally work, didn't work in this case, only because Simon and I called each other. And, and Matthew Vaughn was uh, somewhat in, instrumental in this because... You know, I told him, this is what I want to do. I want to call Simon. Matthew Vaughn was the previous director. The previous he directed director Layer Cake, was on right. the project and left. And so Simon and I got together and said, let's not do this. Let's instead sit here and talk about what we think the movie should be, which, by the way, was very different from what the studio wanted to do. And we kind of went in as a united front. And that, given that Simon and I had both, you know, we were not baby writers, as they say in the industry, it actually helped us tremendously in terms of saying to the studio, you know what, maybe you guys should take a step back and let the peop you know, let people who really love this franchise and really want to work on it full time have some say in what's going to happen with it. Because there was a power vacuum when, when Brian left. I mean, he was the person driving this ship. And, uh, you know, it, it should not work. It should not be. Uh, my wife is a studio executive. It should not be that a studio executive is the key creative person on a movie. It should not be, not because studio. my wife is much smarter than either Simon or I, but you sure. cannot wear both those hats. You must take your hat off and become a producer or become a director or become a writer because there's no way you can serve both those masters. So uh, for Simon and I, it became imperative. You know, one, uh, And the main thing is then we sat down, we actually liked each other and said, Hey, what do you want to do with this movie? And he said, Dark Phoenix. I was like, me too. That's, I, I talked Brian and I doing it on X2. We got to do it now. So, um, so that's how the whole thing came about. So there was never any friction with the studio saying, Hey, we're going to both pay you. We had your deals going. You can't join together. No, we, I mean, we won't it, allow that. I, I think it's, I think it was, it was more complicated. I mean, I think the, the complication was not about payment because I think they felt like, um, they were going to pay us no matter what anyway. And then the, uh, the truth is, if were we, did we not team up? They would have then fired us immediately after our delivering our drafts, and they would have hired another writer to do the cut and paste Frankenstein draft, That's which would be more expensive. Do, yeah. um, so teaming up served us in so many ways. It served us creatively because we had a louder voice as two than we would have as one. Um, we had a presence on set that we wouldn't necessarily have had because Zach had another baby before we started shooting. Then I had a baby while we were shooting. There's some strange thing that happens with X Men movies. Um, 
But uh, my baby's name is Juggernaut. Um, no, I'm just <laughs> it's not. Um, but uh, take that kid out of the crib; he yeah, just keeps yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now nobody's going to pick on him in elementary school. No, that's not his name. Um, but uh, but you know, and and on a movie of this size, these kind of summer tentpole movies, especially when it's based on a big piece of material, i.e., you know, not an original script, and it's a sequel. The vast majority of the time, um, the first writers are not the last writers, and I think because we teamed up. Um, because we essentially became the continuity on the movie. They changed directors. Um, a lot of sort of pieces were moving as we were shooting. Um, they relied on us creatively or authorially, even in some ways, the way that um, usually writers don't get treated on these kind of these kind of films. Uh, so we, you know, it was a it was strategically very smart, ultimately or politically, and I think also it was um, creatively. And I think at the end of the day, for the studio, all they cared about was is this going to make the process faster? And and we said yes. Right. And so they were open to that. And we worked our asses off to make sure that it was faster. But, I mean, both Simon and I are pretty fast writers and when we need to be, if you do production, we write stuff. Yeah. But I, I think the studio was a little bit surprised by the whole thing because we did get together with Matthew Vaughn, who was at the time the director, and say, here's our plan. Here's what we're going to go in and do. And I think there was a, a little bit of resistance, like, whoa, wait, what happens when we want to fire you, which we inevitably will want to do. Right. Um <laughs> And and I think in the end, they understood, okay, these guys, you know, they did an end run around us, but maybe this is good for the movie because this is going to get the script in better shape. And um, a power vacuum doesn't help the studio either because no executive has enough time to actually sit there every day working on the script. So, Just, just before we continue, because I want to start kind of when you guys came together, just to clarify for our folks in the audience, the Dark Phoenix saga is one of the most important points of the comic book of the X-Men. It's a time when Jean Grey does turn into a phoenix who's dark. Strangely, they never called her Dark Phoenix in this movie. Um, but, That's strange. Uh, yeah, but, but, uh, and it was a time where I, I don't think that you could have done what they did on the page. It has all these random characters like the Watcher. She destroys an entire planet. She's on trial for a genocide. She, she begins, destroys a galaxy. She destroys a galaxy. Sorry, I thought it was just a planet. I can't remember. Uh, it's been a little while since the 80s when I read it. But it, 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 is, it is really hard to translate that. In addition to that, Joss Whedon in the comic book came up with a very interesting storyline a year or two ago, a few years ago, about a cure for mutants. And talk about that starting point, how you guys started to wrap your, your arms around Phoenix, knowing that dramatically you have your own ticking clock in the real world. Because I believe you were hired about five months before they were to start production, and there was no script. Is that seven about right? Months, seven months. Seven months. Yeah, still fast. So you you had a very compressed time. That to... means four months before pre-production starts. So right, and and here's the thing: once you kind of know what you're going to do, the hard, the the thing that makes the process long is not the actual writing, like the putting pen to page. It's not you know or computer or whatever. Uh, the thing that makes it long is the process of having to get notes and having to go through 15 people and waiting for people to read the script. You know, when Simon and I were given free reign to write the script in the so-called infamous six-day draft that we did, it sounds like the six-day war or something, but um, we were able to churn out between us 80 pages of pretty good script in six days because there are two of us writing separately and because we knew exactly what we wanted. We had a detailed outline. We had a roadmap, and so... We, and we had to deliver, it was 88 pages or something. The reason he's calling it infamous is because it was leaked online um, on Anna Cool News. And, and, it, and it only had Acts 1 and 2, right? Not yeah. Act 3. And so it was, it was being critiqued as if, like, why isn't there any closure to some of these, you know, right. character arcs? And we're like, because there's no third act. Um, but, you know, that happened because our, our first director, Matthew Vaughn, um, for a lot of different reasons, felt like he needed to go from sort of A to Z um, inside... Uh, the machinations of the studio in terms of giving them the first two acts of the script inside of a week. And so we met with him on a Sunday. Remember this? Yeah. I'm sure you do. Um, I wake up screaming about it sometimes. <laughs> he, he, we met him on a Sunday and he was like, hey, good news. Um, you know, we're really going to get cranking. Uh, I need the script by the end of the week. And we were like, that's not really the way it works in America. Um, and He's and, British for the record. Yeah. yeah, he's British for the record. And we went bananas. I was actually in New York, remember, when we actually wrote that and, and, yeah. and Zach was here and we had a very detailed outline. And without that outline, we would have been, you know, writing nonsensical pages, but, um, we were able to do it because we had a roadmap. But just, you know, to a answer your question before about Phoenix, yeah. one of the things you have to understand is the studio did not want to do Phoenix, period. I mean, and I'm talking last whatever, February, I mean, you know, Five months before the movie began, 
They were like, no, 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 we're not going to do Phoenix. We're going to do Magneto versus the X-Men. That's what this movie is going to be about. And by the way, the cure hadn't even really come up at that point. And so partly what we had been doing was arguing. We spent about three months just saying, no, no, we have to do Phoenix. We can't not do this story. We can't take this play. That's what the first two movies set up. So those were the arguments. It wasn't even about, like, how are we going to do it? Uh, that said, because we felt confident that we were going to win that fight, we spent a lot of time talking about, okay, if you were going to do Phoenix, how are you going to do it? And I had my own ideas from X2. In fact, I had had a lot of arguments with Brian because I felt like we have to make this more realistic. We have to bring the idea of this woman with this unbelievable power out of the realm of crazy cosmic and magic stuff and into the realm of mutants. So um, we had had a lot of arguments already about that um, by the time we started writing. The biggest drama of the Dark Figa so- Phoenix Saga is the fact that you know her old friends need to take her down you know, because they realize what a threat she is. So is there anything else you want to talk about once you did get approval? And yes, Entertainment Weekly said in their article, I think five things you need to know about X-Men a couple weeks before your release, that Dark Phoenix Saga is not in the movie. That was one of the big things that was listed in Entertainment Weekly. That's interesting. So I, I know that Fox was... Yeah, they didn't. They, they weren't behind that element. But what else was it that was going through your minds on that saga that maybe didn't make it to the screen? If you want to tell us really briefly, because it's so hard to adapt. Oh, what didn't make it to the screen? Well, yeah, just something in your concept in a, in a broader scope that maybe you really wanted, but because you had to also have the cure element, there wasn't time or room for. It. Well, I don't think it's time or room. I think that we lost. To be quite frank, if you see the first half of the movie, we won every fight. And if you see the second half of the movie, we did not win every fight. Well, the second half of the movie, I don't think Vomka speaks out loud. Yeah, and that was not our intention, and it was not our choice, and it was not the way it was written, and, you know, that's life in the big city. So um, uh, that's one thing we fought for. Now, we've had a lot of uh, discussions online with fans who talk about, you know, the essential thing of the Dark Phoenix saga is that Gene and Scott's love, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think that's true. I think what what separates Dark Phoenix from so many other comic plot lines is that it is essentially about a woman who cannot control her power to the point where she becomes uh, horrifying. She becomes the worst enemy of the X-Men, but also something that is so dark and sinister that her suicide is actually a positive thing in the comic book that's as dark yeah. a comic book story has as well, has ever and, been and written think about it i mean what are the story i'm trying to think of another story in which someone's suicide is heroic the most heroic act in the movie is her suicide and you know it, it, i think the thing that we feel really good about is it, it's essentially answer, answering your first question the characterization of phoenix not necessarily how it manifests in the second half of the movie but her characterization is something that's very close to our yeah. imagining of it it was really like this is a woman who is pure id who is schizophrenic um, and if you take a schizophrenic person of pure id who happens to be the most powerful being in the universe, they become the most dangerous being in the universe. Trust me, I've met a few. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you almost you almost wrapped like a Sybil type of attitude yeah. in there no, in absolutely. which she was trapped. Well, the story, if you go back and read it, is very Jekyll and Hyde. It's very much about a person whose id has been repressed and who is all, uh, you know, is contained and it does what the men in her life want her to do. And then when that id comes out, it explodes and it scares the crap out of the men around her. And there's some, a lot of interesting, you know, sexual and social underpinnings to that story from Chris Claremont. Um, and I do think in the story between Xavier, Magneto, and Gene and what's going on, we're extremely proud of that. Yeah. We would not have chosen to have Gene stand around silently, but, you know, that was uh, something. And I do happened. think actually in terms of representing pure id, we had the right director for the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Brad Radner, indeed. I think you did. Um, the E is the id kid. Uh, tell me about your habit, you guys. I mean, uh, Simon, you'd never worked with a partner before, really. Zach, you have in the past. What were the idiosyncrasies you guys kind of learned to deal with in this somewhat of a shotgun marriage that you had in which you know you were put in the room and you were writing a $200 million, to my knowledge, budgeted summer tentpole yes. film? and. That's pressure, and it could bring out the best, the worst. What did you guys learn about working with each other? I don't think it I, – honestly, I think if it brought out anything uh, resembling the worst, it didn't bring it out um, in our interaction. I mean, f- strangely, and I'm someone who, who became a writer so I wouldn't have to interact with people, <laughs> like so I could stay at home in my pajamas all day and like call it a job. Um, strangely, I, I mean, I can speak for myself, but you know, it was a pretty charmed experience. Like We had a lot of fun making a very high-pressure – highly contentious movie um, because 
we sort of kept each other light and sane about the whole thing. And, you know, Zach, you can talk to this. He's had a lot of experience working with writing partners. As you said before, we tried every trick in the book. Like, you know, we note carded everything on the walls. We wrote outlines together. We did would, that work, putting yeah. note cards on oh, the walls? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We lived with those note cards wherever we went. Um, and, uh, you know, what we would do really was we would write the outline. We would detail it out. We would talk through the scene in sort of really intimate detail. And then each of us would grab a scene. Um, each of us would go off a lot of the time and separately write those scenes, then hand it off like a baton and then rewrite each other and just keep going back and forth and back and forth. So that I literally can't, with the exception of three or four lines in the movie um, that I know are Zach's, uh, I don't know which who, who wrote what line in the film. And I only know those three or four lines because I remember Zach giving them to me and my saying, wow, that's a great, one of my favorite lines in the movie is when oh, Mystique thanks. says, um, that's, you know, don't, I don't answer my slave name. And now Zach wrote that. Um, cause he says it a lot around the house I and do. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but, but who, who wrote, know, who wrote nobody heals as quickly as you, Logan? I think Simon wrote that line. That, that was, that was a great line we for Wolverine. Did, um, here's another thing. I mean, I, I have had a lot of writing partner. I've actually, um, like the guy who wrote Nacho Libre was one of, was my writing partner. Mike, Mike White. White was my writing partner for a while. I've had a lot of different, one of my ex writing partners is the president of a studio. So, I mean, I've had a lot of different people as my writing partners. And one thing I know is, the more you get to know a writing partner, it's a little bit like a relationship. The more you abuse each other and the more difficult it is. One of the things that was good about our situation is, you know, Simon was a writer in his own right. He had a lot of good credits. He had, a, you know, uh, a big movie coming up. I had a lot of experience, too. There was a lot of respect between us. And because of that, we didn't mistreat each other. We were actually very, we got each other's backs whenever we, look, it also helps to have a common enemy, yeah. which, you know, you, uh, uh, and, and by the way, I say that the, the enemy changed from day to day and from, you know, but, but there was always someone who was trying to stop us from doing what we thought told the best story, always. And so that, you're in the trenches together, you know, and it makes it easier. Speaking of the trenches, and we're going to open it up to the crowd for questions in a couple of minutes. Take us on set. You're, you're embroiled in this huge movie. Uh, it's got to be changing on a daily basis because I'm, I'm sure with all the talented people involved, that's what happens in a creative atmosphere. Yeah. What was your duty and function like on set of this huge film? It really varied wild, uh, sort of wildly. Um, I think it was very writerly at the beginning of the process in that we were still, because we didn't have a whole lot of development time, which again, I think is a, is a good thing often, um, we were still essentially fine-tuning the script as we were um, hurtling into production and really, I think, in the first month, month and a half of production. And I think the script settled into itself a little bit. And I think our role on set was, one, to help Brett um, with the, the sort of the narrative continuity of the movie. So we were constantly talking to him about character, constantly talking to him about where the scene fit emotionally into the movie. You know, because he was catching up to the movie a little bit. He came onto the movie six weeks before we started shooting. Six weeks before you start shooting a $200 million movie is not a whole lot of prep. Um, so... In some ways, our role, or like I can say, my role was was, was a little more producerial. Um, it was a little bit more facilitating yeah. things for the director, um, working with the actors in a little bit of a directorial capacity, the way that producers sometimes do, um, and also managing the machinery of the movie. I mean, I remember there was one meeting where we were going through um, uh, visual effects shot by visual effects shot, budgeting out each shot, saying, do we really need three shots to sell this or two shots? Okay, two shots. We just cut $10,000 out of the budget. I mean, like stuff like that that is not particularly writerly. Right, and quite often, first of all, let me tell you something. X3 changed less in the shooting than X2 did Interesting. Um, in terms of the changes to the script. And that's mostly because, you know, I have this theory, which is you write a script, people like it, then they decide to go forward. They keep having to reread every draft. They keep having to reread it every time someone new comes on. They get bored of the script. That's what happens. Everyone does. The actors get bored. Everyone get, Even the writers get bored. So you start rewriting because, you know, everyone's like, God, it read kind of flat this time. And you want to say, you know, you've got to, you can't, you can't make a movie this way. You're going to get bored of everything. And in this movie, we, luckily that didn't happen. But um, I also think we, I mean, the, the one thing that was really charmed about this film is um, we had, thing that was yeah, we, the craft service. Um, no, it was <laughs> the, that we really had the support of the actors. Um, one thing that yes. was true is, and, and, and I don't say this in any self-aggrandizing way, truly it's just because it's so rare on a movie. Usually when you read, you know, interviews with actors and directors, they never mention the script, and if they do, with, they, it's usually like, yeah, we had 15 writers, or we were really struggling with it. We improv the whole thing. Right, exactly. <laughs> that was my favorite line, because I came up with it in the trailer that day. Um, the, the, the actors were so supportive of yeah. the script 
Um, and really, even one of the criterion for Brett coming onto the movie, from the actor's point of view, not the studio, was we don't think the script is broken. Um, come in to shoot the script. Right. And it is weird. I mean, it was weird. Like, Hugh and Patrick and Ian, particularly, um, really fought for the same things we were fighting for. I mean, for example, Dark Phoenix, like, they got what we wanted to do, and they fought for it. And we would, otherwise, we probably would have been, we probably would have been fired. And, and, you know, even though we have good relationship with Fox, I'm sure we would have been fired at some point, um, if not for that. So during that process, I, I think there was a good solid 15 minutes or so cut out of the film. Was there like an alternate storyline you want to tell us about or anything else that there's not really an alternate no? storyline? I mean, okay. in terms of what we shot, we were just this morning, we did the DVD commentary with Brett. And then after we watched the movie with him, we watched the, um, alternate or deleted scenes. And one thing that was glaringly obvious in watching the alternate or deleted scenes was, that each scene was like 10 seconds long. It was an extra little piece here and there. Um, you know, there were little 30 second scenelets um, that we lost. And, and, but I think mostly what we lost from the, the cut that was 15 minutes longer was breath and lines inside of scenes. Um, you know, the cut that was longer was a cut that uh, was a little more prosaic um, and maybe even a little bit more in line with the tone and the pacing of the first two movies. Um, and Brett has, a, has enough of a different sensibility from Brian that he wasn't trying to foist his... Brett is not a director like um, who, who you can tell his movie from, from movie to movie that he has the same look in every movie. Like a, like a great filmmaker like Fincher or Soderbergh, you can tell... Or, or not so great filmmaker like Remain Nameless, but um, you can tell their look from, from movie to movie. And Brett is actually a little bit more like the old Hollywood um, directors who would come onto a movie and bend toward the film rather than bend the film toward there. He's a little bit more traditional than people think in terms of how he approaches the film. So, um, but, but look, the, the main stuff that, you know, the stuff that got cut, got cut at the script level right yeah. before we went into production. Like the things that, you know, would, we're not going to go into it, but the stuff that we felt, um, we wanted to see in the movie that didn't make it in. It wasn't like we went and shot it and then they cut it out. It was more like everyone kind of put their foot down and said, we're not doing it. There's nothing that. you could tell us about any of that? Well, I've told you some of it already. Right, right. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna destroy my career here. Right, don't <laughs> don't do that. But you know, the another. Th I mean, there is there is. The, we did also shoot certain things. This just might be interesting. Like today, we were looking at at the end of the movie. Um, uh, Anna Rogue comes back and she's taken the cure. Um, and we shot an ending in which exact same scene, at least in terms of the setup and the the actors and the in the space where she um, had not taken the cure, where he shows up and she says, "I'm sorry, I couldn't do it." And he's like, "This is what I wanted." Um, so that was one, literally down to like weeks before we released the movie, we hadn't made the decision, does she take the cure, does she not take the cure? And there, it was a big contentious argument. And it wasn't because dramatically people felt it, it was just like politically, what yeah. does it mean? Yeah. And it was an interesting thing to have a, an argument with studio producers, director, and everyone had different opinion. It wasn't though there was a uniform opinion at the studio or the producer level. Um, and at a certain point, I think we just actually didn't even have such a strong opinion. Yeah, we were like, we, we were don't like, care. Whatever you guys want. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It Either was one of the few things we didn't care about. Um, when we actually saw the movie, we felt like what's good about it is it's ambiguous. You know that that and, and a lot of people are very upset that Rogue takes a cure, but we felt like what's nice about it is you do not expect in a movie like this for characters to do the wrong thing. And that's kind of what you know. Arguably, she's doing the wrong thing. It's right for her personally, but wrong for her. You know, it's wrong in terms of the overall point of the movie. I don't know. I thought it was kind of cool. Well, it's but. interesting, too, because, I mean, I remember there was a – this happened a lot. Um, but there was a really contentious, I'd say, argument between Hugh uh, Jackman and Ian McKellen about whether or not she should take the cure. And once I, I sort of gleaned that – they, Did they, like, throw things or anything cool? It didn't, or, get, no? didn't get too violent, but the claws came out. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, once that wouldn't be a fair fight. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, um, he's a pretty tough customer, but Ian's pretty tough too. You know. Um, well, anyway, uh, he's bigger than than Ian for sure. Um, once, sort of, you saw that it could spark that kind of uh, fight between people who'd been living with the movie for a long time, so it wasn't as fresh for. It was like, well, we should definitely. I, I actually felt like at that point we should actually have her take the cure because anything that sparks discussion is interesting, especially in a summer action movie. It's pretty rare um, to spark, like Poseidon didn't spark a whole lot of like political debate. <laughs> sorry, sorry, that was my one dig, my one. That was, that was a good one, though. You, yeah. you chose well. Uh, Akiva Goldsman wrote Poseidon. I know. I know. Do you know that Akiva wrote Akiva a lot was the last of Poseidon? Writer. Akiva Goldsman did, he? did yeah. Wow. Uh, all right, we, it's not real unless we ask a couple tough questions. There's, there's been a lot of debate. Say these, these politely. I mean, 
you're killing off Cyclops in Act One off screen. You're 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 knocking out Charles Xavier, which was very dramatic, by the way. But I mean, it, no, it was. I mean, the scene was really well executed. I mean, you got the Tarkovsky water floating up to the ceiling. It was it was good stuff. Uh, but 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 I mean, it's like. Where were those decisions in the process? What did Fox think of that? And it couldn't have been because, you know, Xavier, his schedule wouldn't permit. I mean, I'm no. sure it wasn't a scheduling conflict. For those were decisions uh, made by the studio. To, to kill off Cyclops? Was that kind of retaliation for going to Superman? It wasn't or? retaliation. He just wasn't available. And, 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 and I think it's a combination of his lack. Let's just start with Cyclops because that, I think, is the one that people online and fans of the comics are – um, more upset about also because Cyclops doesn't rise from the grave after the credits in the movie. Um, but, uh, but you know, that decision was made for a number of reasons. The first impetus for that was that um, Jimmy wasn't available for the movie. Um, so that's one thing. You have a week and a half with James Marsden. What are you going to do with him? You don't want to incapacitate him having a coma for the whole movie. It's not very interesting, although they did that with Charles in the second movie. Um, it, 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 once that decision was made, though, that we had a limited amount of time with him, and somebody brought up the idea, um, wouldn't it be interesting, genuinely, not from any sort of ugly place, I don't think. Um, wouldn't it be interesting if the first person Jean kills when she rises from her watery grave is the man she most loves? There is something, A, just very dramatic about that, and B, that lets the audience know nobody is safe. If the man that she loves, that she was going to marry, that she's right. been loyal to for the first two movies despite her animal attraction for this other guy, if she kills him the second she literally like shakes off the water, um, you're like, wow, I'm scared. Anytime she's in a scene with somebody, I'm nervous in that scene. And we we pitched that. I yeah. mean, we pitched that in response to, we were told, here's the political situation. Nobody sat us down and explained to us who was angry at who and what the real deal was and how much he was available. Yeah, you we, explained it. If it's scheduling, you came up with a really creative solution. Well, that's the thing. We were given, here are your parameters that you have to work with. Right. And what we said is, uh, by the way, at one point, there was a suggestion that he never even have a scene with Gene. Like, there was, he was going to be killed off screen, period, because he wasn't going to be able to come back. And we both said, how can we do this? She, he's been in love with her for two movies, and she's in love with him, more importantly. We have to do something between them. So we literally fought to get that scene that's there and what Simon just pitched. That was our, for God's sakes, at least let us do this. And I actually do think if they had said no to that, we would have quit. I think if they had yeah, said... Yeah, I think that was one of the few things that we would have literally laid down on the tracks for. We would have just said, you know, we don't... If, if they had done what they had originally suggested, which is, let's just not have Cyclops in the movie, or let's have him die off screen, say he died in between movies or something. Food poisoning. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I think Simon and I would have said, you know what? This is too much. We're going to get... Literally, fans will come and shoot us, and we're not going to be involved in it. You'd that. have to leave the country. Yeah, man. no. Uh Charles Xavier, you know, I mean, it, it is dramatic. And it, again, you're upping the stakes, um, showing that no one's safe. That that obviously is a big deal. And then it kind of changes when he comes back in the end. Well, so talk about just that that loop. Well, that also, th that was an idea that I think came from a, a less, let's put Cyclops aside. The Xavier, He's gone. Uh, right. The Xavier issue was one that a lot of people thought, wouldn't this, kind of in the way Spock dies in, in um, Wrath of Khan, yeah. that this idea was bandied about. And actually, at first I was horrified by it, and I think Simon was too. And then we started to think, wow, that would be pretty intense if the Phoenix Saga got... Because we can't kill four billion people. In a, you know, like we couldn't can't have... Blow Phoenix, up a planet. Right, we couldn't do what they did. And, and one of the things that we felt pretty strongly about is, if you went into that scene thinking... There's no way she can beat Xavier, and he ends up dying. That does a lot of interesting things to the universe. And, and we actually grew to kind of appreciate the idea of it more and more, although you can see one of the first things that we did was write in that extra scene that set up and payoff of perhaps Xavier's still alive because his fans, I mean, I'm supposed to write an X-Men spinoff. I don't want Xavier to be dead. So, um, you know, I couldn't save Cyclops, and neither could Simon, yeah. but yeah. but we did our best. With, but but I do think the Xavier thing works quite well in the movie, despite its controversy. Yeah, and the structure of the movie, and this is something that we said um, once we really were given the go-ahead to, to write our, our, our Phoenix story, the structure of the movie is it opens with Magneto and Xavier going to this girl and appealing to her, and in some ways trying to control her. The middle of the movie should be a true break in Xavier's control of her. And so dramatically, what's a better way to dramatize a break is by killing that person. Um, so she kills that person, and then the end of the movie is actually, Mag in some ways, Magneto seeing just how powerful she is and that she should not and cannot be controlled. Um, so th there is a 
there is a, a, a logic and a symmetry to those three scenes. And so the middle of the movie suddenly became almost, it, it had to be that she killed Xavier. In many of our drafts, she kills Magneto at the end of the movie. I yeah. mean, yeah. it was her power that destroys Magneto. That's right. Um, but that, that was... Uh, that was too much of a body the, count. The other thing hotly debated online is 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 the cure cure. I mean, uh, obviously mm-hmm. Magneto moves the chess piece a little. You know, what what's your perspective on that? What was the thinking in the room at the time when you guys were writing it? Well, the Magneto scene was written fairly late in the process, in truth. Um, yeah. Uh, and at the end of the process, yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty late. Um. Uh. You know. Um. I I I think you know we approach the movie as the cure is a cure. And it is a permanent thing, and you are cured for the rest of your life. Um, you know, certainly in the you know X Men, the movie after the Last Stand, or whatever they're gonna you know if they were to make an X Men four, I once they called this the Last Stand, I was like the Last Stand until the next movie, um, that the be, second to last yeah. stand. <laughs> uh, but the you know, almost final countdown, yeah. right? So you know, um, we we felt like everybody was you could have an antidote in in subsequent movies. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess the logic to that is he's such a powerful mutant. Um, and he is, it, we acknowledge that he being, he and Charles sort of being the utmost and then Phoenix being one above them, that maybe his power is able to sort of, um, resist in some form or he's able to build back up his mutant. I mean, it's, it, it's something we didn't really define when we were writing the script. And then at the end, we felt like, okay, well. By the way, it's pretty subtle. I mean, yeah, he kind of moves that chess piece, but like, it's not supposed to be. Um, I, you know, I think to the credit of the people, because we actually fought against that ending a little bit for other reasons, and I, I, at least I did. I mean, I thought that was a bad call, and then I saw it, and I was like, actually, that's pretty cool. And I was impressed that they had this restraint to make it so subtle. I was thinking it was going to be the chess piece moves, and he says, "Yay, I'm Magneto again." Um, uh, and did I don't. You, think did you write it like that? Yay, yeah, I'm Magneto. That's pretty much how I write every scene. <laughs> Ooh, you're dead. And I, I don't, um, no, uh, I, I was. I thought they did. A, I, I thought Brett really did an amazing job shooting that scene. It yeah, really, and I think Mark Helfrich, actually, the editor, did a really good job of cutting out right at the to, right. to give you a tease without or a tickle without really committing to it. Was there ever a concert of Mystique sitting down to play chess? Yes, there was. Yes, yeah. there was, and okay. we nixed it. Okay, we nixed cool. it because we thought it was, it was confusing. It was confusing, and and we were already a little bit annoyed with the convenience that he happens to be sitting under Golden the Golden Gate, Gate Park. Bridge. You know, it's <laughs> like he just ripped that bridge apart. Why wouldn't he go someplace else? But Right. Um, Memories, but we don't. <laughs> the writers are often the logic police, and we don't. The logic police often lose. So. Yeah, and sometimes actually the logic police are wrong. I mean, the truth is, watching a movie is an emotional rather than logical experience, unless the movie's bad. I think people only start to poke holes in the logic when they're not enjoying the movie. If they like the movie, um, they're emotionally engaged, and that's really what they're responding to. And I think that e- ending is such a jolt emotionally um, that you're not wondering why is he sitting underneath the thing that he just destroyed and the whole world saw. I was sleeping. I didn't see that part. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. 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 Uh, you, you guys, you guys had a lot of really great creative solutions, and I think you worked really well as a writer's team. Thanks. Let's open it up to the crowd for some questions. Right there, you sir in the middle in the black. The the question was about uh, the Dark Phoenix emblem. Uh, was there ever any talk about putting that in there? And also, uh, the secondary characters, Kitty, was you know really spot on. Talk about developing those along with your main ensemble because ensemble writing is tough. But start with Dark Phoenix. Which, uh, I'll do the Phoenix one. Um, I think it's easier. Um, <laughs> The uh, Firebird effect was not only discussed and written, it was rendered. Um, John Bruno, who's the visual effects coordinator for the supervisor for this movie, John Bruno did um, a few iterations of what that Phoenix effect would look like. Uh, he did it in this in the moment where actually um, Wolverine kills Phoenix, um, and she sort of expires, and come, from her comes that final gasp um, of the Phoenix. And then they also tried a version where uh, she does it in sub- b- before that, rather. Um, where she goes dark phoenix and everything starts to explode around her. They did it. They put it in the movie. Um, I don't know that it ever was finalized uh, in terms of the visual effect. The feeling, I think, from Brett and the studio, that was, this wasn't our call. I no. think we both wanted that in the movie. Um, the feeling from Brett and the studio was that we had created such a realistic phoenix that somehow that um, shifted the tone uh, of her characterization, that somehow that suddenly became magic. Um, and they didn't want it to be magic, so uh, they cut it out of the movie. Ensemble writing is always tough. Your main characters, your side characters, you, <laughs> right. they were both really rich. Um, Callisto is a good example because I, I think that was actually my uh, idea that I, you know, I really like the idea of let's have a mutant who can sense other mutants because we knew it would be really helpful in terms of the logic of 
uh, what was going to happen in the story. Which, you know, when you're writing a movie like this, most of it is like, what do we need? We need someone to get us from A to C. So who could do that for us? Who could be psychic? Who can, you know, and you can only have so many psychics. Um, so uh, we like the idea that she had this power that Callisto, that Caliban actually, I think, has in the comic book. Not to geek out on you. Um, but combined a few different characters. Right. For her. We, she's, she's kind of like a mashup of a bunch of different characters because, you know, we didn't know how many more X-Men movies there were going to be and we wanted to get the things that we needed into the movie. So we ended up calling her Callisto because it sounds better for Donya Ramirez than Caliban. Um, but by the way, this, nobody calls her Callisto except for the end credits. Right. And, and in fact, that's true of a lot of the characters. It's just that yeah. we named them so they're in the credits. But quite often it's necessity. It's a, this is what you need him to do, and then here's what happens. You write this character who does what you want them to do, and everyone says to you, the stunt coordinator and the second unit director and Brett and everyone else says, listen, that's great that she can sense other mutants, but she's just standing there. Is there something else she can do? I mean, we'd like her to fight. We, we can't afford to have three other characters in every single scene. And the next thing you know, you're like, oh, what would be a cool power? You know, a lot of these people have secondary powers. How do we do this? So that's the kind of thought process. You're, you're really writing backwards from what you need rather than saying, I love Callisto and he loves Caliban. You know, let's put them together. Um, uh, it doesn't really work that way. Well, and also you guys had a really nice emotional scene, you know, the ice skating scene. I thought that was really well executed. Taken came directly from, from, right from the comics, yeah. There's Almost of, every yeah. scene in this movie is, ha, is taken directly from some issue of a comic book. We, we just, just basically transcribed the comics. Yeah, we didn't do anything. Put it in final draft form uh-huh. and right. turn it in. Just take out the pictures and you got it. Another question. The decision to kill off Phoenix rather than give her the antidote with the one-two like uh, they did to Magneto. Um, I think to not have Phoenix die at the end of the story would have been the ultimate cop out of the Phoenix saga. I mean, she she dies and comes back to life in X Men Two and then the beginning of Three. And to me, it's essential that she has to pay for what she's done. Like, I, I don't think that we either of us would have felt comfortable having everyone say, "Oh, thank God that's over." You know. Uh, so I, 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 you know, more than anything else, even I would have said, "No, she's got to go." I mean. It's right for the story. Yeah, and it's right for Wolverine. I think we felt like, um, you know, the 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 protagonist of this franchise is Wolverine. It's, he's not necessarily the protagonist of the comics. He's the protagonist of, the, of this of the film franchise. And we felt like to complete his arc with her, the love story that was sort of hinted at in the first movie, and then and then sort of explored a little more in the second, and really exploded in the third. The most dramatic way to end that would be a man has to kill the woman he loves in order to save her. That was interesting to us, um, more so than a man has to cure the woman he loves so they can live in some weird Right, strain. because, by the way, it wouldn't cure her. I mean, she'd still be the screwed-up person that she was before. Um, but, I, but I do think, like, that to us was kind of canon, that, you know, she's got to die. I mean, that's the whole... It's right it, out of the comic. It, I, mean, yeah. right out, I mean, right, if it doesn't end with her death, and I know that sounds crazy given that Cyclops, you know, bit the dust, but... Uh, it just that to me would have been untrue to the saga, so um, we fought pretty hard for that. Um, and I also don't think it would have been possible to cure her. I mean, I think it would have been, you know, well, they could point. have taken Leech, I guess, and you know, yeah, but thrown him at him. No, uh, I mean, they could have maybe, but like Leech would have been atomized. Like, right. you know, there's, 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 didn't you say in a draft somebody wanted to have Leech in Matthew a backpack? Vaughn, Matthew, Matthew Vaughn, Vaughn, Matthew Vaughn had a great many very good ideas. Truly, like a lot of them are manifested in the movie and. I think the basic st- structure of the movie we created with Matthew, because we worked with him for months, one very bad idea that Matthew had was that Wolverine would be running through the battle at the end with Leech, the little bald kid, Jimmy, in a backpack on his back. And we were like, Matthew, he's like a 12-year-old boy. Yeah. Like, he's not like a, you know, Lilliputian. Like, where, what kind of backpack does he fit in? I could see the action figure now, man. That would be uh, pretty scary. Yeah. Let's go for another question from the crowd. Right there, you, sir. Who won the battles, and what was the halfway point at which you started losing them? No one won. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, no one won those battles. I mean, the the people who disagreed with us about whether or not Gene should be more active in the second half of the movie, or talk, uh, or, talk or any, whatever, you fill in the blank. The people who argued against us uh, won those arguments, but... I actually think that if if uh, subject to duress would fully admit that they made a mistake now, um, but you know, not in the look. The movie. I don't mean sit here and diss the movie. I think the movie is fantastic and I love it. 
uh, there's always mistakes. I think there's a mistake, big mistake in X2. I won't go into it, but I think there's parts of X2 that go, that are like, take things too far. Um, but we argued and argued and argued and argued to the point where, I mean, I know I almost burned all my bridges and lost the argument. And that's the way it goes. Yeah, you know, one of the nice, this is sort of goes back to the other thing. One of the nice things about being a writing team is you are louder as two voices and you can also play good cop, bad cop a lot. Um, which I'd say Zach probably played bad cop most of the time. Um, but, but, you know, that is a useful thing on a movie because, you know, let's say Zach is playing bad cop, then the producer will come skulking to me and say, hey, listen, you know, we understand. We just want to do it. Th-. You get information you wouldn't ordinarily get because they think they can sometimes play you against each other. And we were a really united front um, with ourselves, but sometimes we were smart about, you know, being my being a little more conciliatory or Zach being a little more conciliatory and knowing a little bit how to play the politics of making a movie, because you are making a movie, it's, in this case at least, with hundreds of people with opinions. But hundreds it, of millions of dollars. Right. And, and yeah. just to be fair, I think that what was going through the minds of the people who were arguing with us is this whole Phoenix thing is great for you fanboys, and they knew that we were fanboys. And actually, I kept people kept saying to me, oh, you're the guy who loves Phoenix. And I was like, hey, I'm just trying to write a good story. <laughs> um, I think that they were very nervous about the themes contained in that story and how dark it was and the fact that it ended up with her death and et cetera, et cetera. And we kept saying, well, we're still going there, so it's not like it's going to get any less dark. But I think that when you're making a $200 million movie, it's very hard to embrace the details of such a dark story. Whereas the Cure stuff and the fight between Magneto and the X-Men, was there was not as many arguments. Well, about. it's a broader stroke, and they right. fought for two solid movies, and right. they joined together in X2, exactly. which was great. I mean, look, I really respect that you guys joined together on that, and, and it is not just about writing. It is about politics too and it's good to hear that you guys fought the good fight a few more questions right there you sir in the back how did you find out that the studio hired a competing writer i'm guessing the question is how did you find out that each other was hired yeah yeah um like I, do they try and keep that a secret like no, they have to actually per writer's guild rules they have to tell you when they're hired another writer to write the same project simultaneously were you guys hired the same day no no, no. um uh i don't know you want to answer this Okay. Um, You're the bad cop. Come on, bring it on. I am the bad cop. Uh, they had hired Simon first, and to be, I'm trying to think of the most politic way to say it. I think that they were, there was a lot of dictation to Simon going about this is what this story is going to be, period. It's not going to be Phoenix. It's not going to be this. It's not going to be that. And to, to Tom Rothman's credit, to his, I mean, it's really like one of the best things about Tom is he felt, Am I making a mistake? You know, he had this sudden crisis of conscience. Am I, Brian's gone, and he was really angry at Brian. I'm sure he would admit that publicly at the time. But he came to me and said, I, I feel like I'm making a horrible mistake here. What do you think? And, and I said, I think you are making a horrible mistake. Yeah. And at that point, he said, well, would you come up with a different outline? And I actually expressed all my misgivings that I've told you guys here. But then once I actually sat down and talked to Simon, like if I had met with Simon and he said, this is horrible. They hired me and let me fight this fight. And I don't want to have someone do this with me, you know, in all due respect, I would have said, okay, you know what? I'm not going to be the scab. I'll back off. But in fact, quite the opposite happened where we're like, you know what? Maybe together we can walk everyone back from this ledge and make an X-Men movie that actually lives up to the Yeah, I mean, the thing that was... You know, we'd never met before. Um, who called who first? Zach just, emailed me. Um, we had how did you get your email? Mutual friend. Okay. Um, Eric so, I mean, right? I'm just asking because it's hard. Yeah, no, Eric, a lot of writers Eric don't Eric connect. Fight. You emailed me and basically... I have my ways. Yeah. And, you know, when we met and, and really I think what Zach was responding to was um, the direction the studio wanted to go with, you know, in the movie. And in the first five minutes, he was like, I, I think this is a mistake and I think that is a mistake. And I was like, yeah, that's a, that, these are the same... We're fighting for the same things. Um and I think originally, like like Zach said, the studio felt very strongly to, they wanted to go in one direction, um, narratively, story wise, uh, and then had this crisis. And they, you know, Tom trusts Tom and Zach. You know, you worked on a bunch of movies for them, and said, "Am I making a mistake?" And you said essentially what I had said, which is, "Yeah, you're making a mistake." And suddenly, like when two people tell you you're drunk, you sit down. Um, and so I think that there was this revelation, like, "Oh my God, I'm actually making a mistake." It's not just one writer telling me I'm wrong. Now two writers have told me I'm wrong. Um, and suddenly these two writers were in a room together saying, yeah, right on. We're exactly right. And um, now we're going to go make our movie. And by the way, he tried to talk us out of it after that initial thing where he said, okay, you guys must be on to something here. Like, uh, I must be really mistaken. Then a month later, he's like, no, 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 I'm right again. 
And and we and and what was good is it was now the two of us, and we said, "No, you are wrong. Remember, you were wrong before. You're wrong now." And 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 this is what's good about you know. Look, I've worked for a lot of difficult people in Hollywood. Um, a lot of difficult people, very very difficult people. And Tom can be a very difficult person at times, but he does have the rare quality, which I mean, I don't, I don't even know if I have that quality, the ability to say. Am I making a mistake? I'm going to ask someone who is not going to be polite about it whether or not I'm making a mistake. I mean, that's why he calls me up. And I, that's that's not an easy thing to do, to sit there and listen to someone that you don't have to listen. I mean, that guy runs this studio. He can I mean, that's he his wants. job. He runs the studio. So that's why there's always conflict when people that run studios come too close to the creative process, sometimes for their own good. Obviously, yes. you know, this movie was very well supported, did very well in theaters. They They had an excellent ad campaign. So it wasn't like they shied away from the final product. Oh, what, no, no, no. Not at all. I mean, it was a very important, it's the most important movie to the studio this oh, yeah. year. It's the, yeah. the, you know, it's the highest um, budget he's ever greenlit here. So he had a lot invested in it in many ways. And the truth about Tom is, and I've worked with less people than Zach has, but certainly plenty of difficult people as well. Tom is passionate about the movies he's making. There are people here in Hollywood, as I'm sure you all know, who fight and argue because they like to fight and argue. Because genuinely, they just want to be right. Not because they believe they're right, but because like they were on a debate club or like whatever girl didn't like to let them go on a date with them. And hide. They're still angry guys, right? And like That's they're true. getting back at you for like some girl or some bully slight in like, you know, the ninth grade. And you're never going to win that fight because they're not in it to hear the right answer. They're in it to literally win. Right. And Tom is not in it to win. Tom is in it literally to, to come up with what he believes to be the best answer for the movie. And sometimes he's right and sometimes he's wrong because he's fallible and he's human. Like, you know, we've both worked around Steven Spielberg. My experience was sometimes he's actually wrong. Um, Tom's yeah, a lot. Guy. He's wrong yeah. a lot. Actually. And he knows it. And that, that's actually but, part right, of Easy there. Is, no, no. Easy. But you know what? Steven Spielberg knows. Steven Spielberg, if someone says to him in a meeting, like, ask directors who work for Spielberg, if a director says, Steven, I don't think this is right and would you want this forced down your throat in a movie, he'll say, no, I wouldn't. Go do what you would. No, and he's surround, he doesn't surround himself with yes people. Right. So, And Tom is, is, you know, as we're saying, basically, is he literally believes he knows what's best for the movie, but is willing to hear everybody else's dissenting opinion. And when, like, as with us, when we say the Dark Phoenix story needs to be the heart of this movie, ultimately, while it may not be as many scenes as we would have liked, it is the heart of the movie. Yeah. Look, I'm still glad you guys were able to join I'm together. Not yelling at you. If, if Listen, you guys, if you guys on, didn't have to tell you, <laughs> if you guys didn't join together, it would have it would have really been a lesser movie. Time for a few last questions. Obviously, they're going to be staying around uh, to sign posters right there. You yeah. sir, in the front row. Yeah. The the art of adapting a comic book, which has many decades worth of material, to adapting a video game, which is some of the other projects you're working on. Uh, yes, Spy Hunter sucked to work on, and it's a bad story. So um, <laughs> no, right. it is. No, it is. It's just there's no story there. It's a it's a car driving around shooting missiles. Um, and I, I, it's funny. I worked on it for a couple of weeks, and I get you know it follows me everywhere. Um, uh, X Men is one of the richest. Uh, fonts of source material in in modern literature, and I say that with no irony. So it's not only is it, I mean, that's daunting, but it's also there is so much material, there are so many great stories in the X-Men universe that it is, it's so much easier than writing an original screenplay in terms of what the burdens on you are. That said, as you guys probably all know, you have a rabid, crazy fan base, you have all these people with expectations of what it should be, you have... Uh, you know, schizophrenic characters and schizophrenic studio executives. So, uh, <laughs> you know, th those are the pitfalls there. But working on something like Spy Hunter, you know, that's not, it's not, you don't jump out of bed in the morning saying, hooray, I'm getting to adapt the video game about, you know, it's like, I used to joke with them. I was like, I have a good pitch for Pong when we're done with this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so. Pong would be awesome. By the way, I'm sure some other writer will do a good job on it, and I'll no, be proved not. wrong. No, you're not. Pong no, or not Spy Hunter? Sure no, Pong is going to be a good Pong's movie. Pong's going to be good. <laughs> yeah. And there, if you look on the internet, type Pong clock you know, into Google. Coolest clock I've ever seen. Really? It plays Pong endlessly. One side is the minutes. The other side is the hours. And it, they're always winning. It's the you know coolest what? thing I, ever. I feel like maybe it is a good idea. <laughs> Locked in battle. Last question from the crowd right there, you in the blue. Question is, what did Stan the Man Lee think of this? Did you guys have a chance to interact with him? You know what? Uh, I haven't seen Stan since the movie was done or since the movie's been out. Um, I'm not even so sure he's seen the movie because I saw he came up on set 
Um, the, for me, the best day on set was um, a day that, if you notice the beginning of the movie, obviously Stan has a cameo in the film, as does Chris Claremont, who created the Dark Phoenix Saga. He's the guy with the lawnmower. And the best day on set was Chris Claremont, Stan Lee, um, Ian McKellen, Patrick Stewart, um, Hugh Jack- everybody was there. Um, and Hugh had actually wasn't even in the scene. He just came to meet see Stan and meet Chris. Um, that was a pretty magical day on set. Stan had um, heard enough about the movie to actually give it his blessing. And Chris Claremont had actually read the script because Chris wrote the novelization of the movie. So he had to read the script. Um, and both those guys had at least blessed the script. And I don't know what they think of the movie. But what I was going to say is I don't know that Stan – has seen the movie yet because I asked him, what do you think of Fantastic Four? He's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to get around to seeing that. He's like, it's it's playing on the uh, Hotel Spectre vision there. I was like, yeah, no, they probably, they maybe they'll comp it if you if you call down to the, the concierge. <laughs> studio will give you a copy maybe at the studio store. Uh, I, I have an extra copy actually I could send him, but, but I think for, also, you got to remember, I think for Stan, a lot of the characters that we're talking about, I mean, you know, no, I've written on five or six Marvel movies, so obviously Stan Lee is like one of my personal heroes, and I know him pretty well. But Chris Claremont created a lot of the characters that we're all talking about here. I mean, they were not in the original X Men; they were created by Absolutely. him. Or, or uh, who's the guy who wrote X Men '94? It wasn't actually Claremont; it was Dave Lynn Ween. I think it was Cock. It, was it wasn't Lynn Ween. No, I think it was Cockrum first, it was Cockrum, and then okay. Lynn Wow, see? I'm, Come on, you're a good This company. is what gives me the ability to work on an X-Men movie, is the ability to pull. Uh, no, so I think for Claremont, he's the person I'd be more curious to talk to, and he wrote, apparently we're movie. in the novelization. You know, we both well, have cameos that. in really? the novel. That's I think awesome. we both get killed. So I don't <laughs> wow. Know yeah, he loved great. it, man. He did he like the movie he, a great deal. If he, no, he killed you off in his uh, book, he yeah, must yeah, have. No, he did, he did. All so he liked the movie, so he's right. Last two questions. There's been rumors on the internet just flying about you and Halle Berry's wig, something <laughs> terrible happened. What was it, man? I mean, or can you even publicly say what you did to can the I wig before Halle yeah. wore it? <laughs> or your fetish with the wig? Um, this is a running joke that Simon started about a year ago uh, that I cannot seem to live down. It's all um, over the internet. It's actually, I'm, pr- I'm maybe more proud of the, the than anything else in my career. The fact that people really do think that there is something happening with Zach yeah. and Hallie's wig, no. Well, you also convinced, Simon convinced a bunch of fans online that I had helped uh, Hugh with his workout regimen. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is, the bad cop. Which is so, so true. Yeah. So true. <laughs> you, no, you, by giving him contrast. <laughs> you guys are a good team. Are you going to work together again? That's my last question, honestly. We will not work together again. Who knows, but, you know, we like writing separately. We play basketball no, we, together a lot. Yeah, we might, maybe we'll do something. Yeah. Maybe X4 when we kill the rest of the characters. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give it up for the good cop, the bad cop, Simon Kinberg, Zach Penn, everybody. And that's how the Q&A went down on the Fox lot for X-Men 3 with co-writers Simon Kenberg and Zach Penn. Thanks again to Simon and Zach for coming down, spending time with us, and chatting it up with the crowd after the Q&A. They're cool cats. We're glad to have them. And hey... If you have a question for the Devil Wears Prada screenwriter, Aileen Brosh McKenna, that is our next screening. So get your questions in to me by Sunday, June 25th. And remember to include your full name and the city you live in, in case we ask your question, we'll mention it. Put Devil Question in the subject of your email, which you could send to rsvp at creativescreenwriting.com. You could, of course, also send other questions and comments because we love hearing from our listeners. And hey, if you want more Simon and Zach info, check out the latest issue of Creative Screenwriting Magazine at any Barnes & Noble or Borders for our X-Men 3 story. And speaking of superheroes, I happen to be the person that wrote the Superman story for that same issue, so check it out. And if you're in the mood to read a screenplay... Don't forget to check out www.csweb.ws, where once you click the Movie Scripts Online button, you could download over 400 different screenplays for free. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, Senior Editor for Creative Screenwriting Magazine, reminding you to get those Devil Wears product questions into me by June 25th, 2006, and thanking you for clicking that subscribe button in iTunes and listening in.